how might we improve a predictor after it has been trained and without having access to the original training data or labels? Hello, I'm James Tompkin from Brown University in the United States, and I'm here with my dear colleague Kwang Eng Kim from the Ulsan National Institute of Science and Technology in South Korea. Consider the classic visual analysis pipeline. Given an image, we use the feature extractor G to provide information upon which a predictor F produces an answer. We assume that the feature extractors available at training time are equivalent to those available at testing time. Fatnik and Ishmalov assumed additional features H that are not available at testing time. They called these features privileged information and so developed a method for learning using privileged information, or loopy. We propose the complementary idea of testing using privileged information, or toopy. Here we have new privileged information as additional features at test time. Toopy is critically different from loopy in that, as is usual in testing, no labels are available, and so retraining the predictor F on the additional features is not possible directly. Furthermore, we may have M additional privileged test time features. Even though we hope that each is useful, we don't know that they are. Any solution must select which features, if any, are useful without degrading the performance of the predictor F. Two P scenarios are more common than you might think. First, if training labels or data are proprietary, for instance, if big tech provides a predictor as a service, but then a small company has additional information at test time. Second, if the training process is prohibitively expensive and it requires TPUs or FPGAs. Third, the training data or labels are restricted, such as predictors trained on high security or private information. And fourth, if data or labels are no longer available, say the data are so large or numerous that storing them is impossible. Another example might be when a faculty member accidentally deletes all the students' data on the GPU server but uh, we promise this was not the motivation for the development of this technique. So at the back of your heads, you might be thinking, if test time privileged information is a predictor from a different task, then Tupi would sound a lot like transfer learning. And Tupi is related, but distinct. Transfer learning typically assumes the form of the predictor is the same. Say, if one predictor was a neural network and another was a support vector machine, then oftentimes it can be unclear how to transfer. In the 2P problem, the form is not assumed, and so the problem is more general. You might also be thinking, well, rather than no labels, if I just had a few labels at test time, then this would sound like semi-supervised learning. And yes, you'd be right, but in the purest 2P setting, we have no labels. Camus and Lampert perform output label space regularization to prefer certain class proportions by refinement by a graph Laplacian local neighborhood structure. They took the required pairwise distances from the training time features, but we could equivalently take these distances from the test time features and apply this to the 2P problem. Their assumption is that neighborhood smoothness can be useful to help improve a predictor. Our fundamental assumption is that useful privileged information will exhibit a strong statistical dependence with a hypothesized perfect predictor. So why might this be a good assumption? Well, suppose the privileged information feature were ideal, then it would exactly correlate with the perfect predictor. Similarly, suppose the privileged information were useless, then it would be independent from the perfect predictor. We might expect the privileged information to be somewhat useful. For instance, its scale or even just its sign might correlate with the perfect predictor. But in each case, we consider every point in the dataset rather than the local neighborhood structure. We're going to use two tools to build our algorithm. First, statistical dependence measures like Pearson's correlation coefficient are only valid for linear relationships, and we might expect the relationship between the privileged information and the perfect predictor to be nonlinear. So in our case, we're going to use a kernel method, the Hilbert-Schmidt independence criterion, or HSIC, to describe this nonlinear statistical dependence. HSIC can detect arbitrary dependencies on random variables, no matter what their form. Suppose we have two datasets, V and W, sampled from their underlying probability distributions. HSIC is zero if and only if V and W are independent. This is a required criterion for a statistical dependence measure. 
To compute HSIC, we first calculate the kernel evaluation matrices using Gaussians of both V and W. Then we align the corresponding kernel matrices via their centering matrix. This gives us a finite sample-based estimate of the statistical dependence of the underlying random variables V and W. Second, we can never observe the perfect predictor at test time because we do not have labels. Instead, we consider the output from our predictor F to be noisy predictions of the true perfect predictor. Then, we're going to employ a high-dimensional manifold denoising algorithm. This will empirically estimate and strengthen the statistical dependence between the initial noisy predictor and the test time privileged information via denoising. Heinemeyer's algorithm supposes that we have data points P as noisy observations of an underlying manifold M. Their idea is to simulate a diffusion process on M to denoise P. We construct the generator of the diffusion process as the graph Laplacian based on pairwise distances W of individual data points P. Then, denoising is given as an iterative time discretization obtained based on an implicit Euler scheme. So let's go back to the diagram of our QP problem statement and use the idea of adapting features with statistical dependence. First, let's declare our test time privileged features as H1 to Hm. We are going to treat the trained predictor F as an initial predictor that produces a set of predictions Fi. And then we are going to use the HSIC and manifold denoising to adapt features to produce an optimized prediction Fo. Specifically, given our initial predictor F and features H, we define the corresponding kernel matrix evaluations Kf and Ki using Gaussian kernels as before. Then we obtain our manifold embedding by casting the predictor and privileged features to their normalized kernel matrices. In this case, the natural similarity measure on the manifold is given in the form of the inner product between the corresponding kernel matrices. This is precisely the HSIC between the predictor F and the privileged features HI when we consider them as sampled from random variables. Now we can apply manifold denoising to our predictor and feature manifold via an iterative algorithm. At t0, the predictor estimate is equal to the initial predictor. For each t plus 1, our algorithm iteratively enforces the similarity with respect to the kernel matrices constructed from the predictor F and the privileged features. The similarity between F0 and the privileged features are measured based on their HSIC values. The magnitude of the corresponding parameter alpha is directly proportional to the corresponding HSIC values. Stronger statistically dependent features are assigned with a stronger weight. Then, F at t plus 1 is obtained as a weighted average of F at t0 and their privileged features. Repeating this process tends to ignore irrelevant features as they are assigned with smaller weights. So let's see some experimental results. And we're going to start with the animals with attributes dataset. And here we're going to try to rank images of animals according to, for example, how stripy they are. We're going to use initial deep learned features for F, and then provide privileged features of surf, fog, and VGG19. Now you will notice that the classical surf and fog features are less likely to be useful than the deep learned VGG19 features. And as expected, our approach selects to use the VGG19 features with stronger weights. Let's look at the improvement over the initial predictor Fi averaged over the 50 different attributes in the dataset. Using a few labels with semi-supervised learning has high variability and generally decreases performance. Similarly, if we used a few labels to retrain a new predictor given the privileged information, this can also increase or decrease performance. Camus and Lampert's coconut on the Tupi problem often improves performance but still has some high variability. And our approach consistently improves performance and due to its selection of useful features, never decreases performance. Now let's look at shoe ranking here, describing how formal a shoe is. 
across 10 different attributes. The privileged information are the output rankings from the predictors trained on the other nine attributes, so a 1D predictor form. Kim and colleagues' predictor combination method applies, but our approach is consistently able to improve performance more reliably using this privileged information. One more example. This time we're going to attempt to estimate torque values for a robot arm using privileged information of velocity features. Here again, we see the potential danger of retraining without being able to select useful features. Our approach instead almost always improves the predictor. Of course, given sufficiently powerful test time features, retraining with just a few labels can be better than our approach. For instance, this situation can occur if we use classical features to train the initial F, but then use deep learned test time features. But one final benefit of our method is that the statistical dependence approach can be combined with the local neighborhood structure idea from Camus and Lampert's coconut. Here in dark blue, we minimize a shared objective that achieves greater performance gains than either method individually. So in conclusion, Testing using privileged information, or TUPI, is an interesting problem scenario. To tackle it, we propose an algorithm to adapt test time features via statistical dependence. This reliably improves performance by selecting useful test time features, unlike some examples where even retraining on a few labels decreased performance. And it applies to black box predictors and test time features of any particular form, so it's widely applicable. So, Please try it out on your problem and uh, let us know how it does. From myself, James Tompkin, and from my colleague, Kwang Kim, we hope you have a great ICCV.